Good afternoon, and thanks to everyone for being here today. We're so happy to welcome John Grade as part of the James Renwick Alliance's Distinguished Artists Series. The JRA is the supporters group for the Renwick Gallery. Our mission is to promote education and appreciation of craft. If you'd like to learn more about our group, please go to our website. John Grady is not a typical artist making precious objects to be possessed and to endure in a museum or private collection. Instead, he's engaged in a different task, purposely designing pieces to degrade and eventually disappear altogether. John has produced numerous works which have been subjected to the elements, immersed in the oceans, buried in the desert, exposed on a mountaintop, allowing nature to be a full collaborator in his artwork. Sometimes he retrieves these works years later and carts them back to civilization to see the effects of their long exile. Sometimes the pieces are left to disintegrate quietly or are broken up violently by stormy seas. That chaos is all part of the process. He revels in the anarchy, the uncertainty of what might happen after his work leaves human control. When making a piece, John remains flexible and open, acknowledging, I just want something to happen that I don't expect. This unusual and refreshing approach leads to some fascinating works, such as the beautiful middle fork tree hanging in the next room. Numerous accolades, awards, and exhibits attest to the success of this approach. We're so pleased to welcome John Grady to tell us more about his creative process and unique vision. Thank you, Rebecca, for that nice introduction. Uh, thank you all also for being here on such a beautiful day. I really appreciate your coming out. Um, I, I would also like to thank the Smithsonian in general, and in particular, Nicholas Bell, the curator of Wonder, uh, for his initial approach and an invitation to join into this amazing exhibition. Um, so I'm going to run through a handful of projects that will hopefully give you a bit of a sense of context for the, the piece we have here at the museum. Am, am I um, audible enough for people in the back? Yes? Okay. Uh, the, the first project that I want to discuss is uh, called the Elephant Bed. And the image that you're seeing here is uh, the sculpture at a, an institution in Brighton, just outside of London, uh, called Fabrica. And it's a deconsecrated church. And I was invited to create an installation here that would last for a couple of months. And the first thing that I did with the team of people there was to wall off half of the space and flood it with India ink. So what you're seeing here are 20 forms that we then built, half of which were gradually lowered into this ink. Um, half of the, uh, the sculptural objects were outside of this ink so that people could move around and experience them and get underneath them and into them. Um, the material of each of these objects is made out of uh, something called Dissolvo, a kind of a novel polymer that's designed to go into our water systems through the drains and not be a, um, an environmental hindrance. So um, it disintegrates into very small particles. It's a, a little bit like a binderless paper that's quite thick. Uh, also very lightweight, so each of these uh, forms is about 24 feet tall but only weigh about 8 pounds. One thing that was happening during the course of the exhibition is that we were gradually lowering each of these forms into this pool of ink. And once they came into contact with the ink, the ink started leaching up into this form in a, in a very painterly way. But it would also then offset the weight of the sculpture such that it started pulling them into the ink. Um, one thing that would also happen with each of these objects is because they were so light, they would be spinning just through the interaction of people moving through the space. Each of the forms was hung by a single line of filament that connected to a pulley on the ceiling of the church. Those pulleys all routed the lines to a point directly over the pulpit so that visitors to the exhibition could come and they could stand at the pulpit just as I am here and there would be 20 lines like a harp 
and it was an interactive piece so that you could either pull or release any of these lines. So you would pull the ones that were hanging over the floor to allow another person to kind of enter into them, or you would release one of the lines starting to sink one of the pieces. Um, you had some kind of overzealous people that would kind of drop one of the sculptures five feet in one go, but um, generally it, it went well and the pieces lasted almost the duration of the exhibition. The forms of the sculpture um, are inspired by a type of phytoplankton uh, called a coccolithophore. So the images that we're seeing here on the right are magnified images of the shells of these little organisms, these calcium shells that we're seeing under a microscope. On the left, we're seeing what blooms of these organisms look like just off the coasts of Great Britain. So everywhere that you're seeing some uh, turquoise in this image is a bloom of these that are, they're living for about a one month period and then as they die in mass, they're going from what had been a life just inches below the surface of the sea to dropping down to the seabed. And I was very interested in, in this idea of what that experience would be like to be inside one of these forms. These, these forms that we're sort of seeing through satellite imagery and through microscope, but not with our bodies. So I wanted to place them in a, in a kind of context that we could feel them that way. The, the piece is called the elephant bed because um, the area in this, this uh, just outside of Brighton, these white cliffs of Dover, um, as these phytoplankton shells of calcium slowly accumulate on the, the seabed. They do this over thousands of years and they've over, over thousands of years become what they now call the White Cliffs of Dover. So it was uh, geologists informally calling this strata the elephant bed that earned the title for the piece. Uh, another aspect of the piece that's common to a lot of things, uh, a lot of the different projects I'm exploring is introducing a way in which you can have a, an intimate moment with the project as well as something where you sort of feel surrounded by its mass. So w one thing that would happen is you'd have either an individual or in this image here a couple of people having a kind of private moment inside the piece. But I also liked that you'd be having this private moment but you'd also sort of be witnessed with this kind of disembodied sort of lower half of you. Uh, one of the restrictions with this project, um, you're seeing here how we built the project, was that I needed to make all of these materials for the sculptures fit into three suitcases on British Air. So it was a sort of very elaborate origami type of project where uh, 70 artists over a very long 12 days helped me put these parts together. So I showed up with these jigs and these clamps and we spent many, many hours putting these together and there was this wonderful kind of cultural punctuation of, of a tea break about every hour and a half that just kind of kept everybody caffeinated and moving through the process. Um, so here you have a, an image of sort of looking into the underside of one of these pieces and up that very long narrow flute. When I returned at the end of the exhibition, uh, half of these forms had completely disintegrated into the ink. The other half were remaining. So again, I brought my three, sa th three suitcases on British Air and this, this time I filled it with lengths of bamboo that could telescope into one another. And what we did is we put a person inside each of these uh, sculptures with a new structure that could make them a, a little bit more stout. And each of these people was in a wetsuit so that we could uh, take the sculptures that were remaining out of the church. This is the, the side door of the church. And this will give you a sense of what it took to march these down these narrow city streets. So I wanted to, in this process, be one of the people inside one of the sculptures. And when you're walking inside the sculpture, first of all, you're worried about your tall top tipping over. So you have a minder. You can see this woman with a very tall stick. It's got a kind of a leash toward the top that sort of prevents the sculpture from falling over and also kind of helps to keep you on route so you don't run into a building. And this is a little sped up so it reads more comically than it was, but one of the things we're worried about is rain, because of course if it started raining these would just turn into a puddle on the street. Um, and wind could have been another difficulty. But we did make it into the English Channel with uh, very quick results, about 30 seconds, uh, all the sculptures disintegrated completely. Um, part of what I was inspired by, or really a, the kind of moment of, of wonder for me on this piece was thinking, going, going to Shakespeare in a Hamlet and thinking about Orphelia in this dress form and wondering what it would be like to experience a dress above you as you're underwater and having that form disintegrate above you. So as we walked into the sea, we had an underwater team with a video camera that was ready to videotape this so we could kind of preserve that moment. 
Unfortunately, we had good luck with the weather, but what we didn't have was quiet enough wave breaks, so there was simply too much water spinning for us to get that footage. Um, I was uh, approached about doing another version of the, of the piece, and this is a, a version for a, a museum that had just opened in Washington State. Um, part of the problem we had with, with this exhibition was it was a, a new space with these very shiny black floors. So during the opening event, we had about 6,000 people, and I think we had 22 people fall into the ink, um, which there, there weren't any injuries, so it was okay on that count. My favorite spot was to sort of see this one-and-a-half-year-old baby crawling and becoming this little dark India ink black form. Um, there was, there was also a kind of wonderful moment. This was in November during the opening, and I was standing next to a particularly well-dressed woman, and she had no idea that I was the artist, and she was watching, as I did, this, this man with white pants um, kind of having a moment with one of the sculptures and sort of, sort of looking at it at the top and then tripped over the edge and, and his white pants became black pants. And she, she kind of had this wonderful comment and said that um, in the fall, this man had no business wearing white pants anyway. So. <laughs> and here's just a, a, an image of that reflection that you're getting to see through the ink. The, the next project that I want to show you is called Capacitor. And this shares, this, um, this shares something with Middle Fork in that it's a piece that's very much designed for a specific space in a museum. Um, and unlike the kind of direct interaction with nature of the previous piece, this is a piece that's designed to draw attention to some kind of abstract element in the natural world. Uh, and in this case, um, a kind of a, a broader sense of climate change. It's a, it's a kinetic piece, so I don't have a video, but if you watch the transition here to this next image, you'll see how the piece opens and closes. Um, and it's doing that through a series of pulleys attached to these hinged elements that are radiating around the museum that are all tied together at one point on the wall to a transmission. And that transmission is driven by a motor and a computer sensor um, it's actually driven by a couple of sensors on the ceiling of the building, on the exterior of the building. And these sensors are collecting every 15 minutes uh, data for the temperature that's outside as well as the wind that's outside. And we wrote some fairly simple software that could compare the historical average for that given 15 minutes in a day. So the, the historical record goes back 100 years. In this case, the museum is in Wisconsin. And what we did is the degree to which any given 15 minute period deviated from the norm, the sculpture would either open and close more quickly or slowly, or and it would also pulse with light more brightly or less brightly. So what you were getting is a sense of how that particular day was deviating from the kind of much longer trajectory of the weather. There were um, a number of kind of wonderful things that happened. One thing that happened shortly after I left the exhibition was uh, a young man proposed to his fiancée in, inside the sculpture in kind of this kind of womb-like form. It's kind of wonderful. Actually, I, I had understood that there, there was some kind of pop-up weddings that were, had been happening here in this exhi exhibition as well. Yeah. Uh, this next project is a smaller project. It's about eight feet tall, and it's called Fold. And the form of the sculpture is derived by my making a cast of my body and then transferring that cast to rubber and then shifting and twisting that over a formwork that made it into more of a cylindrical form. And the piece is made with unique blocks of wood of various different scales. And then each of those unique blocks of wood were capped on either side and a clear polyester resin was poured in between them and then hardened. So you're able to see a kind of translucency through the, the, the resin between the wood. And the form, um, the inspiration between making all these little marks had to do with time that I'd spent. Um, in this case, you're seeing uh, a graveyard in uh, North Africa. And in here, this is a Parisian graveyard. But thinking about each of these little marks um, sort of correlating to a human life passing. And so it was important to me, here you can see each of these little pieces of wood, which are uh, sealed on the top and bottom just before we poured the resin in over them. But that each of these little forms be completely unique and in some way sort of suggest a metaphor for lives. Um, here you see what happens after we've poured the resin and we're uh, refining the surface. And the, the piece came, to, came together into three different sections so that it could be portable. 
the piece was designed to be eaten by termites. So the idea is that termites would uh, begin working on the wood portion, but the, the polyester resin is something that would remain as a kind of superstructure that wouldn't allow the whole piece to fall apart. So after we exhibited it at a number of venues, we then buried it in a location in north central Idaho. And the idea being I had gone back and had earlier exploration where I would put different wood elements of projects into terraria of termites or wood-eating beetles. And the problem I was having there was they're very fragile creatures, so they would either escape or they would die, and it became a very cumbersome thing. So I realized if I could actually just take the work out into nature where these animals or these insects are living, it would be more successful. So this is uh, what it looked like as we were burying the piece. And this is what it looked like about five years ago when we left it. And the plan at this point, we periodically check it to see how the, the progress is going uh, in terms of the termites eating the project. But I'm imagining we'll exhume it in about 10 years. And in that case, we'll be able to bring it up and you'll be able to see it in a museum context where you'll have all this perforation that the termites have moved through the work. This is a related project called Collector, and it was a project where I was interested in comparing two different environments. So with this image, you're seeing the sculpture on my back as I'm moving out into Willapa Bay, which is also in Washington State. And uh, I then anchored it to the seabed where it remained largely underwater. This is a kind of an unusual high tide situation. Uh, and it was amidst oyster beds. The first thing that happened uh, within about two months was the sculpture developed this thick mane of seaweed. And this, this seaweed remained for quite a long time until we had a 150-year storm. And this 150-year storm came through with these tremendous winds, and it tore all of this seaweed off the sculpture as well as everything else in this bay. Um, but rather interestingly, this new seaweed came back and developed that was a kind of very bright green, and it only seemed to attach itself to the sculpture itself. So you could kayak over the sculpture and see this bright green uh, seaweed mass. This is what the uh, sculpture looked like as we uh, were ready to take it out. I set up this, this desire to sort of see how the sculpture might do it. It was kind of miraculous to me that this 100 year, 150 year storm didn't just sort of shear the sculpture free. But I, I set up a limit, and that was if the oysters that were growing on the sculpture were large enough to eat, then we would take the sculpture out of the bay. And if we didn't get to that point, we would lose the sculpture. So fortunately, it did, did survive this. We had this kind of formal feast around the sculpture where we shucked the oysters and ate them. And then I'm not going to go further into the story of the project, but we bolted each half of this to the front of a pickup truck, and I drove the sculpture to southern Utah, where it became this kind of wonderful feast for desert wrens. Here's an image of as, as it came off and it was just going onto my truck with that really bright green seaweed starting to dry. And this is a, a brief image of another related piece called host. And this is a piece that's made largely out of bird seed and methylcellula. So the idea here was that birds come and pick apart the sculpture, and my sculpture disintegrates by just being spread all across the, the forest landscape. Interestingly with this, um, we ended up with a lot of squirrels kind of running out from the trees and picking apart the piece, which you know, you kind of have this moment, do I want to stick with my initial inten intention or do I go ahead and let the squirrels do their thing? Um, I spoke with an ornithologist. This was during a residency uh, at the Grand Canyon National Park, so in the Kaibab National Forest, just north. Um, and it became also kind of a regulatory issue, but this ornithologist said if I were just to introduce some derivative of a hot pepper by brushing it over the surface, these mammals wouldn't tolerate it and the birds wouldn't know. Um, Technically, we weren't supposed to be feeding the wildlife in a national park, but the, the, uh, the chief of the Grand Canyon said, let's just sort of run and move forward with this and we'll apologize later if we run into a problem. And, in, and after applying this, this derivative of the hot pepper, it did work. So the, the squirrels backed off and the birds were able to pick apart the piece. This is a, a video taken of a project called La Chasse, or The Hunt, and it's a project that I did in the north of France. And what I did was I outlined an exhibition space. And so you're seeing here this kind of linear outline of the architecture where I would then create this piece. So this was a kind of a study that I was making out in the woods. And I spent uh, almost two months 
out here both working on the piece and then just sort of sitting with it. And interesting things started happening. I had done so many projects where I moved through the landscape or went in and set something and left it. So to actually just stay still was, was a really an interesting and rewarding experience. Um, I had some hunters that nearly accidentally shot me. That wasn't that so interesting. That was kind of awful. Uh, but more interesting was having these wild boar periodically run through uh, the area. And I would come each morning and then I would leave each evening. And oftentimes I would come back and the boar had kind of torn through certain areas of the sculpture. So here's a, a, an area where they had done some damage. This is a very thin wood structure that's held together by a thin fishing line and a fleeting view of one of these boar. Um, when, it, when it came time to my actually documenting the piece, it was the first time that I'd gotten high up into the trees, and I realized this was a, a forest that had had quite a lot of um, fighting, a lot of conflict during both world wars, and there were these slight depressions in the ground that were these echoes of what had been trenches in this trench warfare. And it turns out that the boar were running along these trenches, and those were the areas that they were breaking through the sculpture. So there was this kind of logic to how it was that they were breaking apart the sculpture. For me, I felt like it was, in the end, a really interesting kind of conversation I was having with these boar because they would damage the piece, I would come back and repair the area that they had damaged, and then they would re-damage, you know, almost the same spot. And you would kind of have this record of all these patches across the sculpture. Uh, this is a, a project that just finished about a year ago, and it's in the sculpture park at the Austin Contemporary Museum in Austin. And it's a piece called Tower Canopy. And the idea here, it was, it was inspired by a moment I had walking through this forest where I was standing under three very large trees, and it was a very, very windy day. And intuitively, I would have thought that the wind would catch all these trees and kind of move their canopy in one direction. But instead what was happening was the tree canopies were all moving in very different directions to the point where even the base of the trees were starting to twist and torque. So I wanted to, to take a closer look at that and kind of draw attention to it, to other people. So what you're seeing here above on the top, it's a little hard to see, but there's a break in this ring, this, this 24 foot diameter ring of steel that's supporting the sculpture. It's actually in three parts. So the sculpture is hollow, and it's suspended from these three parts of steel. And if I show you another image here, a little bit closer, and here I think is the best illustration as we're installing. So we're grafting each of these sections of these rings to each of the trees so that as those trees pick up wind, they start to shift the shape of, of that circle. It no longer becomes just a circle. This is a view if you were to stand inside the sculpture. So you're allowed in through the bottom, and it's a kind of a framing device. So as you're standing in there, you know, the hope is that you're looking up and you're sort of witnessing a sense of the canopy in a slightly different way. And, and the windier the circumstances, the more interesting it becomes. As that wind starts to build up, what is a circle starts to torque into an ellipse. So you're getting a sense of that movement. And the, the physics of this is kind of wonderful because even though the top of the sculpture is contorting like this, the bottom of the sculpture is just going up and down rather than kicking the side to side. So it's a little bit disorienting, but actually a, a very safe experience. So I'm going to talk now a little bit about Middle Fork. Um, this is uh, some imagery. I think I'm going to pause because I've got some. There we go. Um, so uh, the first little clip here, no, okay, better, um, shows the, the actual tree that we cast. I, I, I assume that a lot of people are familiar with the fact that this was a standing living tree. It, it was important to me that, that the tree that, that we chose was something that was essentially um, one of many. It was just kind of representative of an average tree. But beyond that, the special characteristic needed to be that this tree was the same age as the Renwick. Um, to draw that kind of specific correlation between what was specific about this exhibition and the tree itself. Um, when looking at the tree in the casting process, initially it occurred to me that we could digitally scan this tree in a couple of hours and then we could put it into a digital plotter and we could, a three-dimensional plotter, and essentially make this sculpture out of a plastic and it would be enormously inexpensive relative to the way that we went about it. But what was important to me was that 
myself and the other people helping me, there were about 12 of us, have this experience of intimately getting to understand small nuances of the tree. I mean, we all think we know the basics of a tree, but when you're actually hanging and suspended up in the tree and spending many hours um, laying a mold onto a different section of a branch or a part of the trunk, you start to question why the branch has started to bend and move its way out and kind of envisioning, you know, perhaps dozens and dozens of years ago, this limb making its way towards some kind of light source. So I, I wanted to kind of have that reflective experience to feed both the, the making of the casts, but then also to translate that into the process of working on the sculpture that we built over those casts. The, the image we're seeing here is of a, a workspace called Mad Art, and this is in Seattle, and it's in a very uh, busy part of the city. And the, and the mission for this organization um, is to show people how sculptures are made. So it's a, a big glass storefront and a very busy street, and the idea is that people walking by sort of see a project unfold. And this was the first project that this, this um, new venture had sponsored. So, I wanted to take that mission and marry it with this idea of actually asking people who are walking by in the street to actually come in and, and directly participate and actually help us make the sculpture. And it was very successful. I was a little surprised by how many people were interested in doing this. We just had a small sign on the window saying, feel free to come in, and if you'd like to participate, you're welcome to. And people would. They would come in, and they would agree to work for four hours. And so you'd spend a good portion of that time getting them up to speed in terms of how to make the piece. Uh, and then um, after that, many of these people, here's a, an image of the process of, of laying all the, the little pieces of wood. Um, many of these people would come back. They would come back, you know, day after day, and we had a one-year period of time that we were working on this space, and that was our, our finish line in terms of getting it done for the Renwick here. There were some really interesting social dynamics that came apart, that came about because of this. It wasn't so much about the project itself as it was about this kind of time to have this reflection, and I think there was this success in that people were asked to put each of these pieces right up against that mold um, with as much fidelity as possible so that they're kind of getting to know that aspect of the tree that we got to know while we were hanging from ropes. We had a number of areas that were more complex than other areas, and so it would be somebody that had been volunteering for maybe a couple of months that would then get into an area that would be a little bit more challenging. And there were some really interesting social dynamics. We had quite a cross range of different people that were working on the project. There was one woman that I really love this story because she kept showing up with a, a different man each time, and we <laughs> kind of realized she was vetting dates through this process. And, and fortunately, she seemed to have found her man because they came together then for the last several months of the project. Um, so after we had all of these people building with these different blocks, which they'd each individually shaped and carved and placed, we then took the, the pieces into the studio where we then sanded them down so we had this more refined surface. And the idea there was... Um, basically such that we could highlight the form. I think one of the most successful parts for me, when you're looking at the sculpture, of course, we worked on it vertically, but when you're seeing it horizontally, your eye kind of travels along these lines where the pieces overlap. And if one person, or even if it were just me and the, the people that work with me in my studio, I think we'd have a much more homogenous set of these lines. Um, instead, we had so many people with their different input doing different things their own way that these lines kind of move in these erratic patterns. And you'll also see on the sculpture a number of areas where people chose um, pieces of wood that were either lighter or darker and kind of created these patches. So people took um, quiet initiative to, to slightly deviate from the general group of us. The uh, other thing I wanted to highlight has to do with the smaller sculpture, which is downstairs, which I think is a little easier to overlook because it's only eight feet tall. But the idea in looking for this sculpture was to find a sculpture as far north, as far beyond what we know of as the tree line as possible. Um, so um, after speaking with a couple of older Inuit hunters who told me about a grove that was a couple hundred miles north of where you really should find trees, um, this is a, an image of the grove. You can see in the foreground there a little grizzly bear. He, um, he wouldn't leave for a while. We had spent a lot of effort getting to this grove, my wife and I, um, on a boat. And when we finally got there, we kind of had to wait 24 hours for this bear to leave the area. Um, because there are so few trees, that this is what they'll use as their kind of scratching posts. 
The idea with this, this tree as a kind of separate venture from the larger tree was that I was the only one casting the tree and then I was the only one building the form around it. So there's this kind of juxtaposition from this really collaborative group effort to this much more solitary effort. And here's our, our image of the kind of unusual vantage of the sculpture here. The, the, the closing remark I wanted to make was just to touch on a couple of projects that are um, unfolding right now. We're, we're about to open a, a large sculpture, if anybody's familiar with Craters of the Moon National Park, which is in north central Idaho, a very remote area, where we went in and we made a bunch of um, mapping, digital maps of the inside of Labatu Caves. And from those digital maps, we've now made a kind of spiral out of wood. So you'll be able to go to this national park and there'll be a temporary installation in which you can essentially move through one of these lava tube caves, but it's much more perforated and above ground. So you have a very different experience. And another project that we're working on in, in my studio right now is based on this landform we're seeing here, uh, which is called a pingo. And that's, that's me, that little figure on the top of the pingo. It's this, this very large form. And this is in the Arctic, um, in the very north of, of Alaska. And because the Arctic is so flat, these pingos are, are very important special forms, especially for wildlife. You'll have wolves at the top of them and these colonies of little tuk-tuks. Um, and the way in which these these pingos form, the little diagram, is you get a little ball of ice that's, that's trapped just between the layer of permafrost and the top layer of soil. And each year as the, as the seasons change and the top cracks open, a little bit more water feeds into this block of ice. So this block of ice is gradually growing. So it gets to the point after a thousand years that this block of ice is 150 feet tall. So about 45, 50 years ago, the scientists first began making ground penetrating radar images of these ice forms underneath the soil. And we're now going in um, in a contemporary time and making another scan of these. And I'm comparing those two different scans and making a large sculpture based on the difference between those two forms. Um, the final thing that we're going to do then with these two different forms is essentially make a very large mobile. So this mobile will have as many as 10,000 parts. And the piece is called murmur after a murmur of birds because it's going to all be suspended in the shape of this pingo, but we're going to uh, introduce an electromagnetic charge and all of these small wood pieces that each have a small magnet embedded in them are going to disperse into this kind of cloud of bird-like forms hold their shape, allow people to walk into the interior, and then return and enclose you so that you will essentially feel what it is to be inside one of these large cores of glass, or excuse me, of ice. So this is, this is my final image, and I, I thank you very much. I know we have a couple of microphones if anybody would like to ask a question on either of the sides here. There's a mic here and a mic over there as well. Don't be afraid. <laughs> Ma'am, if you have a question, come up. Come up to the mic. I don't know if I'm tall. I'm tall enough. <laughs> Um, it's so fascinating to listen to your way of describing your process and I'm an art teacher and I've been teaching for 24 years and I do a lot of public art projects with my students and the community and I was fascinated by the collaborative part of the project here on display and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, other experiences you've had working with non-artists mm -hmm. in your work since they are always such grand projects and what that's like as an artist, how that impacts you as an artist. Absolutely, thank you. Um, about three years ago I went to Emory University to do a project and they in invited me to create something with the help of a lot of students. And these weren't um, solely art students. The idea was that we would get students across campus from a lot of different disciplines. So the request was could I come in, make a large impressive installation for almost no money. Um, and so I said yes. And what I had asked them to do after an initial vi visit to, to the university was to collect uh, as many clear water plastic bottles as, as they could. And so over the course of a couple of months, they collected almost 40,000 of these clear bottles. 
And what we ended up making was essentially a kind of a, a large chandelier form. And we did this by taking each of these bottles, cutting them in a spiral, and then hitting them with a heat gun. And when we've done that, at the bottom of, of this kind of long icicle form that we created, there was a little bit of a cup. So this is able to collect rainwater. When we put all these together um, on a, a net that we suspended in the middle of the quad from these old pecan trees, we had so many thousands of these little forms that when it would rain, each of these little cups would collect enough water that the whole piece would sort of rise and sink as much as, as five feet. And it was, it was very rewarding to see all of these different students from different disciplines get engaged in the process instead of people who are sort of focusing on art. And it felt like it, it, it brought together quite a lot of interesting ideas. And some of the things that came from that were um, discussions that had to do with um, diseases. So we started thinking about mosquitoes and their larvae kind of collecting in these things. And it, it spawned this whole series of, of videos that could be projected onto the piece as well as then um, this, this whole idea about how we take the piece apart, which then involved the dance department and choreography. So it, it sort of opened up from there. Hopefully that answers Thank that. Thank you so much. Thank sure. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's been a marvelous presentation. Thank I'm you. very curious about your use of technology in terms of the materials, the mechanics, um, or the ability to stimulate your projects with certain opening, closing, etc. Mm -hmm. How do you stay current? How do you identify them, and then how do you stay current with the technologies that are appropriate for the projects that you identify? You know, for me, the key is about collaboration. So rather than my kind of very specifically dictating the technology, is to bring somebody in and have a kind of co-ownership, so that they're they're clearly represented in, in getting the credit for what's going on. Um, that's a, a very important part of it, especially because for me to try and stay current with so many of these things, I, I learned that that was a, a prudent approach, especially coming from engineering. You know, the more that I learned that I didn't know and by bringing in these various engineers that I could rely on, on their expertise, um, that became, I think, key to that. So it's, it's the kind of the collaborative nature of it. Thank you. Good afternoon. My question is, can you, well, two questions. First, can you explain the title, Middle Fork, and then what will be the final resting place of the sculpture once it leaves the runway? So the title, Middle Fork, is based on the location of the forest where we cast this old hemlock. And it's the middle fork of the Snoqualmie River, which is just adjacent to this, this patch of forest, which is on private land. And so the idea after the sculpture has traveled, it will go to a couple of other museums after it's here. And with each museum that it travels to, it's going to slightly grow in scale so that it can be site specific to those museums so that it will fill the spaces in some way commensurate with what we have going on here. So um, I'm trying to remember the second half of your question. Sorry. I was oh. wondering what what will Where become will the of it? sculpture go when it, when it leaves here? So it's, after it goes to these museums, it's going to be brought back to the forest where there's the living tree, and we're going to lay it at the base of that tree. And over, it may be decades, it will slowly moss over and disintegrate into the ground. And because it's on private forest land, we will be able to have tours where the public can come and see it, and we'll kind of organize that in some sort of a regular schedule. Thank, Thank you. you. Right here? Do you, do you mind reiterating the questions? No, so I'm curious about what your art education and background are that lead you to this incredible form of art. And secondly, are you influenced at all by Andy Goldsworthy? So for the first part, art education, I think, was a very important part of this for me. And then I was also growing up around science quite a lot and poetry, so on either of those ends with my parents. but. Um, to, to, to address the Andy Goldsworthy part, absolutely, I, I'm, I'm very interested in what he does. I think that there's a, a, a set of differences that are, that are very important, um, but I definitely appreciate that work, yeah. Thank you. Can we maybe take one more question? I have two questions for you. 
The first one is, it seems like there is a lot of physics and science in your works. Do you get any help from people? Absolutely, yes. With the, with the science, there's, there's a point where I'm bringing my own kind of initial interests into it, and then there's this wonderful period of time where there's research that's going on, and then you're kind of getting to this point where you're bringing in these experts that can kind of really flesh things out much more fully. My second question is, what inspires you to create this piece, The Middle Fork? You know, I think there were a couple of really basic desires. One was, what would, it, what would it simply sort of feel like to sort of see this experience of the interior of the tree in the suspended way? So just like everybody else, this experience of what it is is, is ultimately the, the goal. But I think maybe even more so, I'm very curious to see what's going to happen when this sculpture is laid out along the forest floor and what's going to happen to it. We're going to have a series of trip cameras, and then we're going to also have time-lapse video. So I'm imagining various animals are going to interact with it, perhaps burrow into it. But I'm sure things that, that I'm not ever even anticipating might happen, and hopefully that becomes interesting. But thanks for the questions. No problem. Um, thank you all. Oh, maybe just one last question, sure. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my question is, because a lot of your work is, um, the work is you give it up at the end or you let it go, it disintegrates, give it back to nature. So I'm just wondering emotionally or just on a more personal level, how do you handle letting, it, letting your little babies go? You know, for me, that's actually not that hard. I, it's, it's the interesting part of it. I think that getting to see that happen, I would feel like I would really be missing out not knowing what's ultimately going to happen. You know, this idea that, that so much gets preserved in a museum and that, it, you know, eventually something is going to happen. That something's going to happen to that museum. It might be in hundreds of years. But for me to get to witness and learn from the process of how something is going to disintegrate or come apart or fall. And also because I bring a lot of intention to how that happens. Um, one example is a piece that I've got in Portland right now, in Portland, Oregon. And it's a piece in two parts. And both are designed to fail. Um, they're, they're both designed to fall apart in on themselves. One's made out of wood and one's made out of cast iron. So that cast iron piece is very carefully calibrated to fail, but it's going to fail over a four to 6,000 year period of time. And it's a, it's a very interesting conversation to have with an engineer about how do we know just when this certain thickness of a certain tab is going to fail. Because generally with an engineer, you're, you're looking to sort of come up with something that's strong enough and you can triple or quadruple the force that you need to hold something in the way you need it. And in this case, we need to figure out as accurately as possible just when something's going to fail. So when you go to this effort to sort of calculate how and when something's going to fail, it becomes something you really want to witness. That answers that. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your questions and for being here.